Well, I'm not going to say it. Banking, Housing, Urban Affairs Committee will come to order. Uh, Dr. Carolyn Kuski will join us virtually from, I believe, Philadelphia, perhaps. Uh, and um, Mr. Wright and Ms. Hernandez will join us and, and are here in person today. This hearing is a continuation of our efforts to enact a long-term reauthorization of the National Flood Insurance Program. The program has been extended 25 times since 2017. The latest extension will expire on September 30th of this year. We've heard from multiple groups representing the broad sc scope of stakeholders, realtors, public works officials, business community, floodplain managers, mortgage lenders, FEMA officials across two presidential administrations. They deliver the same basic message. A long-term reauthorization is essential because flooding is the most common and most costly natural disaster facing families, businesses, and communities. Multiple factors are involved. Outdated flood maps, population growth and at-risk areas, land use patterns, overstretched infrastructures, and in, in infrastructure in many areas all play a role. Climate change is only making it worse. It's causing more frequent extreme weather events. It's making rainfall and snowfall less predictable. In recent weeks, we've witnessed the highest river flooding in over 20 years in parts of the upper Mississippi Valley. California, unusually wet weather, has resurrected a lake that's been dry since the 1980s, inundated, inundating prop, productive cropland, threatening downstream communities. An extreme rainstorm overwhelmed Fort Lauderdale with over two feet of rainfall. According to NOAA, nearly half the United States is at risk of flooding this spring. All of this hurricane season hasn't even started yet. Flooding is devastating to families and homes and businesses and communities. It's only getting worse, these disasters also often fall hardest on low-income families and communities that have fewer resources to prepare for and to respond to them. We'll hear from one of our witnesses about particular challenges faced by rural communities. We need to help our families and communities to adapt and become more resilient both to the flooding we face now and to the increases we are know, know are coming in the next decades. Whenever possible, we want to help communities avoid extreme flooding altogether through pre-disaster flood mitigation. NFIP is critical to that. It provides $1.3 trillion in coverage to 4.7 million homes and businesses in 22,000 communities. There are a number of things that separate NFIP from the private insurance industry. Unlike a private insurance company, the NFIP does not just provide insurance. Its job is to prevent and minimize flood damage in the first place, not just help with recovery. And if IP combats the overall threat of flooding through four related components, flood insurance, floodplain management, floodplain mapping, and mitigation. The bipartisan infrastructure bill provided a down payment on new opportunities for communities to help own home, homeowners by providing additional funding for grants to mitigate homes prior to disaster or to expedite post-disaster buyouts for those who choose to move out of harm's way. We need to build on that investment because of continued denial of the breadth and the scope of the climate crisis by some members of Congress. Unbelievably, a significant number in this Congress continue to deny the science of climate change when the cities and their states are at sea level or below and their forests are on fire. We know flooding will get worse and require even more resources and more aggressive action to prevent. We'll just reauthorize and strengthen NFIP and invest in flood mitigation and floodplain management before disasters happen in communities. Last Congress, we heard from stakeholders, including practitioners working with communities and families. We learned about barriers to underserved communities and families participating in flood mitigation programs. We learned about the benefits of expanding the community rating system to help communities reduce local flood risk. We learned about the importance of helping communities and proper property owners to understand their risk, both through improving mapping and other risk communications and through disclosure of flood hazards to prospective owners and tenants. And we learned the importance of building state and local capacity to carry out our floodplain management and mitigation programs, especially for small and rural communities of like places, people like, like Montana. We heard FEMA's recommendations for strengthening the program, including forgiving the overhang of debt from previous disasters and providing means-tested assistance to help more families afford insurance. 
I'm interested in hearing our witnesses' recommendations for ways we can strengthen NFIP so that it can serve all communities, including rural and underserved and tribal communities, and how flood resistance is part of a holistic community policy. It's no secret that NFIP reauthorization has proven to be a challenge. It's complex with multiple goals with implications for many of the things people care about most, their homes and their communities. I believe, however, it's possible for us to come together to reauthorize and to improve this program. I look forward to working with Ranking Member Scott and the members of this committee to strengthen FIP and the country's comprehensive approach to mitigating flood risk through a long-term reauthorization uh, bill this Congress. Senator Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for joining us. Appreciate both of the witnesses and the one here with us virtually uh, talking about such an important conversation. I'll certainly say as a lifelong South Carolinian, I understand the real loss and impact that flooding has on our communities because I've lived through them. In 2016, after Hurricane Matthew, I remember the devastation in a small town called Nichols, South Carolina, where the devastation of the storm was hard to watch. I mean, even days after the storm was gone, the water was still above my knees as we looked for ways to help rebuild that community. <clears throat> Just two years later, Hurricane Florence came through the same town, washing away lives, homes, and businesses. Eight people were lost that year in South Carolina due to the storm. When I think about these experiences, the one word that does come to mind is the, the word resiliency. It's really important that our communities are resilient, and I will say without any question, the people of Nichols, South Carolina, and so many of the other hard-hit areas have proven to be resilient people. If the homes and the infrastructure built in these communities had the structural resilience to match the spiritual resilience of these residents, we wouldn't see the same kind of devastation that we do in the wake of major storms like Matthew and Florence. Uh, before coming to Washington, I spent a few years uh, in the insurance business, uh, about 23 of those years in the insurance business, and more than half of that time was selling flood insurance. And I will say my experience goes back to Hurricane Hugo that devastated the Charleston area in a way that very few things ever has. And when you understand and appreciate the necessity of programs that work, you certainly do have an affinity and appreciation for the National Flood Insurance Program and, and its mission of helping out during the, some of the most challenging situations that we see. You couple that with FEMA, you understand as a community starts to rebuild the importance of having a federal program that works. My concern is that when you look at the National Flood Insurance Program, the one thing we have to say is that it hasn't worked the way that it was intended to do. If you look at the fact that in 2017, we canceled $16 billion of its debt, and yet NFIP still owes more than $20 billion to the taxpayers. That, to me, is a problem. And I think we can't just look through the prism of hopefully the federal government shows up when there is a need. At the same time, we have to make sure that the federal government, the programs within the government, are as efficient and, and as effective as humanly possible to meet the broader needs of the people. One of the challenges I've often said is that I was trying to do some basic math here on the back of a piece of paper here, as Chairman Brown was so eloquently speaking, it, 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 three states, Louisiana, South Carolina, and Florida, represent a disproportionate share of the premiums that flow into the National Flood Insurance Program. But when you look at the flood occurrences and incidents around the country, what you'll come to conclude is that flooding is, is impacting communities in Ohio, uh, devastating communities in Iowa, and yet 40% of the premium that funds the program comes from three specific states. That means that the formula that we're using to calculate who should be paying into the system is insufficient and certainly leaves the program underfunded. We have to re-examine the theory in my, my perspective, Mr. Chairman, not just flood insurance, but catastrophic occurrences that are happening more and more across the country. For us to understand and appreciate the necessity of what we're talking about, you can't do it in a silo of just flood insurance. We have to have a broader conversation about our catastrophic occurrences because taxpayers are subsidizing 
wind activities, tornadoes, and other challenges, as well as flood activities. So when you see it from a panoramic view, you come to a very different understanding and appreciation for the weight of catastrophic occurrences on the American people. Planning for that is something that we have just done poorly because we continue to see flood insurance and flood challenges, the national flood insurance program as a coastal program and the rest of the interior may not have to worry about it. But the truth of it is that we're seeing so many incredibly expensive incidents in the interior of our country and not simply on our coast. And, and that reinforces the importance of us having this conversation today and thinking about not only where they happen, but where the most vulnerable communities are least prepared to respond to the challenges. Uh, one of the, the areas where I think we could spend more time in disaster management is the area of prevention. That's why I'm reintroducing my bipartisan legislation, the Repeatedly Flooded Communities Preparation Act. This legislation seeks to provide more resources to those areas of our nation that face consistent and continuous flooding. Breaking the costly cycle of repeated flooding and rebuilding is an ounce of prevention and it certainly is worth a pound of cure. Too often, both our conversations about flooding and the federal spending meant to address its focus is focused on large cities on the coast where the costs and disasters are high. But we can't forget about the small towns and the rural communities far upriver who oftentimes have even higher risks, as I just described a few minutes ago. Most of you are aware of my work on Opportunity Zones, where economic development incentives are targeted to communities who need it most. Recent changes to better target federal mitigation efforts to underserved communities will have similar positive impacts. Without an actuarially sound insurance program, and that's the challenge of premium insufficiency, is it's not actuarially sound because we have not understood the risk as it is, as opposed to the way that we think it should be. This program will never be financially solid. Without better mitigation and mapping, costs for the insurance side of the program will continue to grow. That is why comprehensive reform to the NFIP is essential, and doing so is the only way to ensure that flood insurance can remain affordable, accessible, and most importantly, helpful to policyholders when they need it the most. Let me just finish on that one thought there. We look at the FEMA disaster recovery. I think the maximum amount is around $39,000 that people are able to be eligible for, whether you have flood insurance or not. Uh, we, we have to figure out how to make sure that Americans who need the coverage have the coverage, which I believe will reduce the burden that we're putting on the NFIP. Uh, we have to understand the risk as it is. And once again, not as we wish it was. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Scott. Uh, we're joined by stakeholders to share their ideas about ways to improve NFIP and better protect our communities. Dr. Carolyn Kuski serves as Assistant Vice President for Economics and Policy at the Environmental Defense Fund. Before joining EDF, Dr. Kuski was director of the Wharton Risk Management Decision Processing Center at the University of, of um, Pennsylvania. Mr. Roy White uh, leads the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety. Prior to joining, he served as Chief Executive of the National Flood Insurance Program and testified before this committee. Uh, welcome in person, Mr. Wright. Um, Ms. Patricia Hernandez serves as Executive Director for Headwaters Economics located in Bozeman, Montana. She has practical experience working with rural and undercapacity communities and tribes on flood mitigation grant projects as well as research experience. Uh, welcome, Ms. Hernandez, in person. Uh, we will begin uh, with Dr. Kuski, uh, remote from Philadelphia. Dr. Kuski. Good morning. I'd like to thank Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Scott, and the esteemed members of the committee for the invitation to speak to you today. And I'd also like to thank this committee for their attention to this topic. I'm the Associate Vice President for Economics and Policy at the Environmental Defense Fund and have been researching the NFIP for over 15 years. And that prior work informs my testimony today. 
I'd like to start by stressing the important role that insurance plays in recovery from disasters. Severe floods impose enormous and variable costs on households, ranging from property damage to evacuation and temporary living expenses to cleaning up debris or buying fuel and generators, the list goes on and on. Most households have insufficient liquid savings to cover these expenses outright. Disaster loans are often a first line of defense, but for lower income households, additional debt could make their financial situation more precarious and limited repayment ability often means they're locked out of access to credit altogether. And we know that federal disaster aid is too limited or too delayed or too difficult to navigate. So with limited other options, insurance is essential for financial resilience. In ongoing research, for example, a colleague and I find that after hurricanes, households with insurance are less likely to report high financial burdens and less likely to have unmet funding needs. We also find that widespread uptake of flood insurance improves local economic recovery by increasing visitations to local commercial establishments. This echoes, echoes other research findings that insurance improves recovery and that lack of flood insurance can actually widen inequality post-disaster. For over 50 years, the NFIP has been providing this necessary coverage for millions of households. But as you know, we still see far too many households at risk not participating in this important financial protection. That's driven by many factors like lack of sufficient public information on flood risk and the cost of flood damages, as well as our own individual optimism that when the sun is shining, disasters won't happen to us. Another key driver is that far too often, those who need insurance the most are simply unable to afford it. But without the resources to recover and obtain safe housing again, households might have to cover the recovery expenses in ways that can have negative impacts for their household or limit their ability to build wealth, like having to defer medical expenses or fall behind on bills or drain retirement savings. And that's why equitable access to affordable insurance is so important. There's now increasing concern about affordability as prices rise to more closely align with risk at a property level. Risk rating 2.0 made really important reforms to the way the NFIP prices policies, but it did not come with a means-tested affordability program, which would require congressional action. Many researchers and agencies, including FEMA and the National Academy of Sciences, have long advocated for this approach. It should be supported through taxpayer dollars, be scaled so that the amount of support phases out as income increases, and be available to anyone, current or future policyholder, in or out of the SFHA. But I want to stress that the best way to address higher insurance prices is to lower the underlying risk. When risks are lower, insurance and disaster costs are less expensive. Prior investments in risk reduction by FEMA and the NFIP have paid dividends around the country. And right now, as mentioned, there's more mitigation grant funding available than ever before. But while this new funding is substantial, it's actually still far below demand. And as the risk of climate extremes continues to grow, so will the need. In the face of this, the NFIP can keep doing more to support risk reduction. A first step is providing better information on flood risk, today's risk, and risk as the climate changes to households and communities. Before a community permits development or family decides where to live, they should have an understanding of how the frequency of flooding might change, of the magnitude of those floods and their financial implications, of the full cost of insurance today and potential increases in the future. But right now, none of that information is easily available, creating information failures that can lead to risky decisions and information distortions in housing and mortgage markets. The NFIP can also provide greater financial support for risk reduction. This could include greater funding for post-disaster resilient rebuilding, support for community mitigation, including nature-based approaches, a renewed focus on repetitive loss properties, speeding the time it takes to secure buyouts when owners want to relocate post-flood, increasing capacity building and technical, technical assistance to under-resourced communities, and also supporting low-cost flood mitigation options as well. Finally, I want to note that ensuring disasters is difficult. Their catastrophic nature poses challenges to the private sector. And that's why we have so many public disaster insurance programs from the NFIP to the California Earthquake Authority to state wind pools. But these public programs still have to figure out how to cover the cost of catastrophic loss years. The NFIP was never designed to do this, hence why it's now $20.5 billion in debt to the U.S. Treasury. This is a debt that all observers agree cannot be repaid by the program, and policyholders should not be shouldering the million dollars in interest the NFIP owes daily. I'll close by noting that with a suite of reforms and a long-term reauthorization, the NFIP can be put on a sound path to providing financial resilience to households and communities, as well as reducing long-term federal disaster costs as we grapple as a nation with growing climate extremes. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Kuski. Um, Mr. Wright, you're recognized for five minutes.
Good morning, Chairman Brown, Ranking uh, Member Scott, and Senators of the community. Uh, community resilience seems to be the raison d'etre of the uh, disaster world. And a decade ago, community resilience was an aspiration. It was frankly more of a talking point. With recent investments funded by Congress, the United States has put significant dollars into mitigation programs across the federal government. The question is no longer whether more federal funding is needed, it's how we spend those funds most wisely. As mentioned, urban communities experiencing coastal funding, uh, flooding, make the news quite a bit, but the flooding is national. It is regional in this kind of space. Suburban and rural communities across the nation experience that, yet many lack the expertise and the resources to address the risk or even to seek out the federal aid we can do better for them. The built environment should be constructed to withstand what we know about the natural perils, especially when we know how to build and mitigate in ways to withstand Mother Nature's fury. The science on flood mitigation is more straightforward than it is for the other perils. Uh, you build higher and stronger, you elevate. You get out of the way of the water, you relocate. Or you redirect the water, drainage and other flood infrastructure projects. While the engineering piece of this is clear, the path to bring these solutions to flood-prone homes and communities is far less clear. Mitigating before an event is always the goal, yet too many homes file repeat flood claims. So I commend FEMA for its Swift Current Initiative that incorporates repetitive loss home acquisitions into the disaster recovery timeframe, yet there is still room to make Swift Current meet the mark as being swift. Make it happen in real time so that the point of insurance claim is the point of grant offer for these repetitive losses. That said, property level mitigation will never be an efficient means to tackle this problem. Parenthetically, I'll say property level mitigation is the right answer for wildfire or for uh, wind risk. A single flood elevation or relocation project changes the experience for a single family yet it does not bend down the overall risk curve. Neighborhood scale endeavors are best. Elevate a full block of homes and the entire neighborhood returns after the water receipts. Buy out a couple blocks of a subdivision to leave room for the water and the first responders don't need to approach the area during the flood. The water can flow. Neighborhood scale and infrastructure flood mitigation investments do more. You consider what New Orleans uh, during and after Hurricane Ida. While too many homeowners experienced devastating and preventable losses from Ida's wind, the flood systems worked and homes in New Orleans were spared flood damage. Final note on investing in flood resilience, using mitigation grants to reduce risk to existing structures and communities is inherently reactive. Grants help us address previously made choices, both where and how we built our homes and communities, yet we need to become more proactive in our approach to flood resilience. We cannot keep putting structures in harm's way and then question why we have billion dollar flood disasters. Unless we drive down tomorrow's risks today, we will stay trapped in a cycle of asking our children to pay for our short-sighted choices. Flooding will always be with us, so we do need more tools in the toolbox. The 117th Congress gave us a formidable tool in the Community Disaster Resilience Zone Act, CEDARS. The CEDARS approach identifies the communities that are at most risk to disasters and at most need, and then facilitates a whole of government approach. And should Congress choose to expand CEDARS usage, it has the potential to catalyze private and philanthropic investment. When private capital is incentivized in these resilient zones, we will be less reliant on the government grant funding to be the sole basis to solve these problems. FEMA is passionate about the possibilities for CEDARS. This passion needs to be translated into action. Finally, a footnote on reauthorization. I've been at this table a number of times on this topic. If the work of reauthorization was easy, Congress would have passed a simple long-term reauthorization years ago. 25 small reauthorizations over seven years, the story is the same. Congress needs to pass a long-term reauthorization that provides the program and customers with stability. I look forward to your questions, Chairman. Thanks, Mr. Wright. Ms. Hernandez, welcome. You have five minutes, please. 
Brown. Mike Funkin. There we go. Thank you, <laughs> Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Scott, and Senator Britt. I'm the executive director of Headwaters Economics, an independent nonprofit based in Montana. And we work on community development, primarily with government partners. I'm here today to share how mitigation efforts that start before disasters strike can reduce burdens on federal disaster programs and make communities safer and more prosperous. So at Headwaters Economics, we run free technical assistance programs that help rural communities reduce flood and wildfire risks. And we've worked with over 100 communities across the country, so we've learned a lot about local needs and what successful disaster mitigation looks like. We are seeing proof that mitigation works. It yields cost savings for taxpayers and protects properties and livelihoods. One of our partners is the rural town of Three Forks, Montana, and in 2021, their floodplains were remapped, showing that the risk of catastrophic flooding was much higher than they had previously understood. So much of Three Forks was mapped as floodway, which is essentially a no-build zone. And the residents, of course, were rightfully scared of what would happen to their property values and their insurance premiums. And it really did seem like the future of Three Forks was in jeopardy. So we partnered with the city of Three Forks, their staff, their local elected officials, state agencies in Montana, and local engineers, and found a solution that could eliminate nearly all of their flood risk. So the project creates a grass-lined channel that captures floodwaters and then directs them back into the Jefferson River, preserving the land for cattle grazing and protecting the town. And the cost of the project is $5 million, which is much less than the expected $60 million of damages that would happen if a flood, a single flood, were to occur in Three Forks, but still $5 million is far out of reach for most rural communities. So after one failed attempt at a FEMA BRIC grant and then technical assistance from FEMA Region 8, the, the partnership successfully secured the largest FEMA flood mitigation assistance grant that has ever been awarded to a Montana community. So that project, it protects residents and businesses, it, pres it preserves workforce housing and agriculture, and it will help avoid future NFIP claims. It's a really exciting example of how investments in flood mitigation can reduce insurance burdens on homeowners and taxpayers. But an important part of that story is what didn't work so well and what we can do about it. So communities like Three Forks have a very hard time funding mitigation before disasters. Urban communities are more than twice as likely to win mitigation grants than their rural or tribal counterparts. And this is, of course, because large cities like New York City have experienced staff available to coordinate partnerships and write grant proposals. It's also why Headwaters Economics developed the Rural Capacity Index, which is a national tool that measures whether communities have the resources and the local government staff, like planners and engineers, to secure funding. So our rural capacity map shows that there are thousands of communities across America that lack the capacity required to access disaster mitigation funding. So what can we do? First, let's fix the huge gap in technical assistance. And I'm talking about support to cover activities like helping rural communities identify mitigation solutions and compile grant proposals. Second, there's a lot we can do to streamline funding requirements. And at the top of the list is waiving local match requirements, which are very difficult for rural communities with a limited tax base. Third, we can encourage federal agencies to prioritize funding for low capacity communities. These strategies will yield large savings from avoided losses, they'll alleviate pressure on programs like NFIP, and they're gonna allow projects that protect communities from flooding to move forward. So thank you for your time and for elevating these issues. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Hernandez. Let me start questioning with you. I was intrigued by the Three Forks uh, community, Jefferson River story that you told. Uh, what unique challenges, if you'd expand on that to small rural or under-resourced communities face with floodplain management, especially mitigation efforts, what recommendations do you have, if you could be more specific, coming out of that story at the local level for carrying out these initiatives? Yeah, so I, I have a, a great quote from you from the mayor of one of the communities where we work in Glendive, Montana. She said, all these federal agencies, this is Mayor Olson, all these federal agencies agree we have severe flood risk, but we can't afford to fix it ourselves. So this is what we hear very commonly from rural communities. They need assistance with economic solutions to address flood risk. So understanding the feasibility of mitigation options, we can help with technical assistance. Um, developing revenue strategies, that is something also that um, communities need help with, even if they're not pursuing uh, grants. Um, if they are pursuing grants, they have local match requirements. If they aren't, they need to locally fund flood, flood mitigation. So again, technical assistance is key, but beyond that, I think we can do a lot to invest in partnerships. Our approach at Headwaters Economics is partnerships between communities, rural and urban partnerships, but also across levels of government. So when the local communities have a problem or want to advance a project, they know who to call at their state, at FEMA, et cetera. Thank you. Um uh, David Marstead, Assistant Administrator of, T of FEMA, testified last week in the House that debt interest payments in 2023 uh, were about a million and a half dollars a day, $600 million. That's not touching, of course, the principal of 20 plus billion. You've previously testified the debt is unlikely to be repaid. Do you agree with FEMA that the program's debt must be forgiven? Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. I, I've had the opportunity to uh, testify on behalf of both Republican and Democratic dem uh, administrations on, on this topic. What I can tell you is that the debt that exists, uh, the principal cannot be met. I also, five years removed from my time at FEMA, understand that you've got to find a politically uh, feasible pathway forward. The real issue is the interest. And today, that is, when I was leading the program, $250 million a year in interest uh, servicing. That's gone up to about 500. It's gonna keep going. The, inside of the next 18 to 24 months, they're likely to be a point by where the average interest rate is five or 6%. When I was there, it was one and a half percent. It could mean that 33 cents out of every dollar is gonna be going to this. So I think Congress needs to find a way to address the interest piece of this. How you want to deal with the, the budgetary pieces of what is forgiven or not, I, you got to find a politically viable solution. What they can't afford to do is to pay the interest. I, I, I guess that's a yes, that the program's debt must be forgiven. Is there any other route to go there? I understand the political difficulty of that, which you cite, but... So yeah, if, if I, I know there have been conversations that I was a part of that says they would set aside and reassign the debt. Um, frankly, you just can't make it go away. You can reassign it back to Treasury. Um, you could direct that Treasury self-fund uh, the interest side of the equation. I just got into a point that says, at the other side, they can't make those payments. I'm with you on that. It likely is going to require a creative Washington-type solution uh, to get to the finish line. Yeah, well, Washington-type solution might be put it aside and ignore it, but that's... That's not really a solution, and you know that from your- Seven, seven years into um, Thank this. Thank you. Uh, doc, Dr. Kuski in Philadelphia, uh, lots of talk about the free market and the free market taking care of this, and I guess that means the free market would take care of, of flood maps and mitigation and insurance and cleanup and all the things that Ms. Hernandez mentioned, and that doesn't even seem- in the realm of possibility and in in a, those who argue for free markets for everything. Let me ask you this, Dr. Kuski. Do you see the private industry taking most of the risk from the NFIP? Good question. The most recent estimates from the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, which collect data on private flood insurance, are that less than 10% of residential first dollar policies are with the private sector. So the NFIP is insuring over 90% of residential flood. And while advancements in data and modeling have led to this small increase in the private sector, which can be good for consumers with greater options and maybe lower costs, 
um, it's unlikely the private sector is ever going to be able to provide coverage for a substantial share of those at risk. We did a detailed assessment of the private market several years ago, and all the stakeholders we talked to found this to be the case that there are just high risk areas that the private sector is not going to be able to cover. And in fact, when you look around the country right now, where risks of other climate disasters are increasing, southern Louisiana, Florida, parts of Texas, parts of California, we're seeing insurers pulling back and limiting coverage and raising rates, not leaning into this risk. Okay. Thank you. Sir Scott. Thanks, sir. Mr. Wright, thank you for being such a proud South Carolinian and representing us so so well. A uh, couple of questions for you. I think it's yeah, it's fascinating that we spend a little time on the $20 billion that we have in the uh, flood insurance program and the debt that we have. You've taken the 1.5% interest rate to 5%, one-third of the overall revenues that come in go out for interest uh, payments and servicing the debt. That means that fewer dollars actually solve the problem of flood insurance. And I thought about what you were saying there and said, you know, what if you were a country that had $31 trillion of debt, that same 1.5% goes to 5 or 6% interest, multiply that by six, 30, $31 trillion, you come up with the single largest line item in all of your expenditures. It's not your military, it's not your domestic programs, it's not the futures. It's literally servicing your debt and maybe without actually reducing a single penny of your debt. So if we have a crisis at $20 billion in the flood insurance program, and we do, there's no way to forgive $16 billion or $16 trillion of our national debt. That has to be paid back. So you think about the actual weight of the out-of-control, reckless spending of my friends on the other side of the aisle, and you come to the conclusion that sooner or later, you got to pay the piper. And the challenge that we're facing as a nation is that we seem to be completely disconnected from reality, that somehow, some way, we can continue to have conversations around raising our debt ceiling without actually reducing our spending ever. That seems to be uh, some place that I haven't been, an alternate universe that doesn't exist. And if we're this concerned, I'm glad to hear that we're serious about figuring out how to deal with the $20 billion of debt that we have in the National Flood Insurance Program that is a crisis for the program. $31 trillion is a crisis for the American people with $98,000 on average being owed by every single American. So thinking about what we're trying to figure out here, more than two years after passage of the ARPA, Democrats' reckless spending has, still has $150 billion sitting on balance sheets around the country. Of the funds that have been spent, there are far too many examples of waste, trying to figure out how to meet the obligations without wasting money. Billions of federal dollars spent on golf course irrigation, bids to host the World Cup, and other activities that are almost certainly not addressing the needs of vulnerable people. Additionally, programs specifically designed to mitigate flood saw substantial funding increases. FEMA's Building Resilient Infrastructure Communities, BRIC, or the FMA, the Flood Mitigation Assistance Program, or the STORM, as you know, all the acronyms of alphabet soup here, and numerous other programs at the Army Corps of Engineers and other agencies saw billions of new funding. My, my simple point is that sometimes excessive spending on programs doesn't always solve the problem. That leads to my question. Is now the time for more spending, and is now the time that we should ensure all this funding is spent in smart, targeted ways to mitigate risk? Thanks, Senator. I think at a, at where we currently sit today, uh, the allocations that have been made uh, are sufficient to address uh, the near-term pieces of this risk. The biggest challenge, and you've hi highlighted this, is getting the money to the rural and non-urban context. The money is available. Now let's go back through and um, spend it well. How, how do we do it? Give, give me, can you give me some examples? So One I, of the challenges that we have, of course, is you look at the... Uh, Areas that are, I use air quotes to say, prone to flooding, mm -hmm. like Charleston where I grew up. But you see so many of the challenges and the incidents in areas that have zero flood insurance. We, we had the mm -hmm. other witness talk about uh, the 90% the of flooding will be paid for by the NFIP and not by private insurance. Well, uh, the, the mapping that we're talking about, not only we're, we're looking at the next iteration of the mapping, we need to rethink the definition of mapping to include the interior of this nation that continues that flooding, and we haven't done that. So 
expanding flood insurance, I think, is a good idea. But how do we get to the question on the table? Yeah, I think, Mr. Scott, I, I, I think, as I mentioned, that community disaster resilience zones uh, legislation that Congress passed last year yes. is really pivotal. It says go identify 100 places across the country where uh, the need is great and the natural, re uh, and the, uh, natural perils are going to collide and make sure that they get the help they need and they get the priority that they need. I think, I think that's a place where the funding and the authorities that Congress has already put in place need to be used by FEMA and the National Flood Insurance Program so that, yes, we're helping Charleston, but we're also helping uh, Georgetown and we're helping Columbus, uh, Ohio, and we're addressing the needs uh, in Montgomery, Alabama. All of those need to be addressed, and I think the tools are there if the agency will choose to act. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Senator Menendez in Jersey is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let, let me first start off by thanking you and the ranking member uh, for holding this hearing. I hope it uh, marks the start of a effort by the committee to provide a long-term reauthorization and reform of the National Flood Insurance Program. And I certainly look forward to working with uh, the chairman and the ranking member. Among other things, our NFIP REACT is, I think, a good bipartisan piece of legislation to try to achieve that. Now, despite flooding being the most frequent and costly natural disaster, just 4% of Americans have a flood insurance policy. FEMA has long struggled to keep premiums affordable, and it appears that the NFIP's new rating methodology, risk rating 2.0, has only made flood insurance more out of the reach for working and middle class families. In Patterson, New Jersey, where the median household income is $50,000 a year, 180 homeowners will see their premiums increase from an average of $1,500 a year to an average of $4,000 a year. In Keensburg, New Jersey, where the median household income is $76,000, 1,000 policyholders will go from an average of $1,300 to $3,500, and the list goes on and on. But insured or not, flooding is going to happen. And when it does, the federal government will be in the unfortunate position of providing less beneficial, more expensive disaster relief aid. So, Ms. Kluski, uh, you have stated previously that flood insurance should be available to any household in need. Shouldn't Congress create an affordability program to help families cover the cost of flood insurance? Yes, thank you for this question. I agree that this is a really important pi policy priority for the program right now. We know, as you mentioned, that there are no good substitutes to insurance when it comes to having access to sufficient funds quickly to cover the financial shock of a severe flood or any other big disaster. And we also know for many households, flood insurance premiums are simply more than they can afford to pay. But without that financial safety net, these types of extreme disasters can create downward financial spirals for households where they might default on loans or accumulate debt or exhaust their savings. And so a means-tested affordability program would make sure that everyone had the financial protection that insurance provides, which improves not only their recovery, but also provides positive spillover benefits to the community as people are able to get back on their feet faster. Thank you. Thank you. And, and uh, after all, insurance is about spreading the risk. The broader the pool of those participating, the less likely that the uh, premiums will be prohibitive. The smaller the pool, then the prices go up. So we should be wanting to and trying to make the pool as big as possible. Far too often, natural hazards significantly disrupt our economy, hurting the nation's productivity and financial well-being for families. When the private market fails to provide sufficient insurance to protect assets and property, the federal government has an imperative to step in. Ms. Hernandez, one example of this is the USDA's crop insurance program. Do you know how much it costs the federal government per year? Thank you for the question, Senator Menendez. The crop insurance program is not one that Headwaters Economics works with. From what I understand, the cost is something on the order of seven to 10 billion annually. Um, of course, with an insurance program that's federally funded, whether NFIP or crop insurance, the preferred approach is to reduce risks so that you're reducing claims. Right, so it's $8 billion. The CBO projects it will cost 40 billion over the next five years. That funding is critical to keeping insurance affordable for the farming sector, which makes up 1% of our nation's GDP. 
By the same token, coastal communities make up 30% of the nation's GDP, but the premiums in the National Flood Insurance Program remain out of reach for many coastal communities. The NFIP doesn't receive any government appropriations to incentivize participation. Like the crop insurance program, it is equally in our national economic interest to provide sufficient resources to ensure that flood insurance coverage is affordable and that we invest in mitigation to reduce future damage. Uh, and so I hope we will keep that in mind as we move towards that um, effort. Uh, uh, one last question. Uh, one legislative proposal provided by FEMA is the idea of continuous coverage, which would allow policyholders to keep their NFIP discount if they leave the program to go to private flood insurance, but later return uh, to the NFIP. Uh, Ms. Kuske, do you know of any property and casualty company that offers continuous coverage for its policyholders? No, that's not something the private sector would do. Yeah, I've never heard of that either. Uh, and this is just one of the ways in which we are having challenges um, with the NFIP program as it exists. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Mineta. Senator Brett of Alabama is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here today and your willingness to testify before this committee. Mr. Wright, you have a strong background in working with families and communities that have suffered damage from flooding and severe weather. Since 2011, Alabama has led in building resiliencies into home construction. In Alabama, we have a state program that supports investments so that families can fortify their roofs against wind damage. That investment allows homeowners to get a discount on wind insurance. Yesterday, May 1st, 2023, Alabama celebrated 44,000 homes fortified. We certainly have seen success in our state. It is my understanding that you were able to join Commissioner Fowler and uh, Deputy Commissioner Chapman to be able to see this firsthand. Can you speak to what you saw in the great state of Alabama and any lessons we can learn and take into the topic we're discussing today? Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Senator Britt. I was in Mobile and Dauphin uh, last night uh, before I made my way here. And what is striking about what has played out here is uh, the lessons learned from Hurricane Ivan and others and the destruction that played out said that th those coastal communities knew they needed to do something. What Alabama did uniquely is find a way to make sure everyone knows what the risk is, to put incentives in place on the insurance place, to put building codes in place, and to put a grant program. This was, the grant program in Alabama is fully funded by Alabama. They do not use federal dollars in that space. But when Hurricane Sally came and approached mm -hmm. and hit that direct line straight on, what we were able to see is that they withstood the wind. They were not getting water intrusion in those spaces. Uh, these homes had a combination of wind insurance as well as flood insurance in that space. And so I think it's an example as we look at the broader flood elements that are here, we need to make sure that we're dealing with the entire ecosystem, have the right ways to make sure that we're not making the matter worse because all new construction in Southern Alabama meets those standards. Um, we then nudge folks who have the ability to afford to do it because they get a price consideration. And for those who can't afford, there's a grant program to help them along the way. Well, I appreciate you taking time to see the success firsthand. Yeah. I certainly believe many of the lessons that we've learned in Alabama and the changes that we've made um, could be applied to this space as well. Agreed. <laughs> Given the scale and complexity of flood risk, it has been historically difficult to estimate and manage the damage and cost related to flooding. The level of damage we've seen from recent storms and related national disasters, natural disasters, have even further emphasized the need for FEMA to pursue a framework that more accurately reflects risk and effectively manages the cost of flooding under the National Flood Insurance Program. This not only includes managing cost following a natural disaster, but also by promoting sound mitigation efforts in communities ahead of these events. What steps has FEMA taken, Mr. Wright, to help strengthen flood mitigation efforts in communities across our country and protect homeowners and lower the national flood risk? 
Yeah, so I think, appreciate the, the elements that are there. So FEMA does a tremendous amount of work related to helping people understand the risk. The maps get criticized quite a bit, but I will tell you there is no other country on the planet that provides parcel level risk analysis for a natural hazard like flood. It's the only place where it goes. And, and so we use that so that we can keep ourselves from repeating the problems mm -hmm. and move the other side. Uh, uh, and then address those that are not yet there. There's been uh, talk here about risk rating 2.0, and while I'm five years removed from making those decisions, I did launch that program because there were up to 25% of the policyholders who were paying too much. Mm. They needed to have their price reduced, and others that had more risk. And so we've got to couple this place by which we do have insurance that is actuarially sound, uh, that customers can count on, that we make investments at a neighborhood scale to reduce that risk and make sure that we don't make the problem worse. Well, in your opinion, what more could FEMA be doing? So um, FEMA could be making, um, so I think that FEMA needs to accelerate the actions that they have in place, Okay. right? So I mentioned CEDARS. It's in place, I think um, they're talking about it more than doing. Uh, they put SWIFT current in place. I know that uh, uh, staff on both sides of the aisle worked very closely uh, with that over the last seven or eight years. It's the right thought. It's lagging. It's lagging. So the effectiveness is not there yet. Correct. Okay. Thank you. My time has expired, but really appreciate you all being here today. Thanks, Senator Britt. Senator Cortez Masto of Nevada is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to the panelists uh, who are joining us today. This year, Nevada and other Western states have seen record-breaking amounts of uh, precipitation with the snowpack levels at 144% higher than average. Uh, in fact, the Sierra Nevada snowpack is currently the largest snowpack in the world. And President Biden declared a major disaster in Nevada. He ordered federal funds to be available to eligible local governments in the counties of Douglas, Eureka, Lincoln, Lyon, Mineral, and Story. These funds will repair or replace facilities damaged by the severe winter storms, flooding that comes from it, landslides and mudslides Mrs. Hernandez, let me ask you, um, the Nevada Department of Insurance earlier this year urged Nevadans to get flood insurance. Uh, many lifelong Nevadans have never needed a policy, but now will do, will need it due to the climate change. Thousands of homes in Nevada will be at risk of flooding over the coming years. How do we incent and educate homeowners in places not historically associated with flooding to get a policy? And uh, I guess my question to you is what has worked in Montana? Right. Well, first of all, thank you so much for, for that question. And it has themes that have come up in terms of um, letting folks know that there is risk. And we are also seeing uh, floods from snowpack in other parts of the country, including Montana. Um, the, the issues are, as Senator Scott mentioned, that there's places in the country that are flooding that it it were it wasn't historically a problem so we can definitely support FEMA in expanding and accelerating maps and education so that there is an accurate accounting of where the risk is that would also help get folks enrolled in NFIP um, the issue with that is if we are going to have education that allows people to know that there is flood risk, it has to be paired with resources to do something about it. And that is the, you know, the primary, uh, what, what's being communicated to us on the ground when we work with community partners is, okay, we're, we're getting our FEMA floodplain updated or mapped for the first time, but it's not coming with any resources so that we can actually address the flood risk. And so I think that a, a pairing of those resources is really important and it's gonna help with the solvency of the program. Thank you. Let me, let me touch on something, because I agree with you, the resources are, are necessary here and that's part of the challenge. In President Biden's emergency declaration uh, for Nevada, it notably left out one of our affected counties, which is Churchill County. Uh, the county didn't trigger a federal assistance in part because they put preventative measures in themselves, right? They paid for it themselves, they put preventative measures in, and it is unlikely they will get reimbursed for those preventative measures. So how can federal funds do a better job of encouraging prevention? 
I mean, isn't that what we really want on the front end is to have them anticipate, oh, we see the snowpack, we see what's going to happen, let's make sure the flood's not as bad as potential could be, we're going to put preventative measures, but then it's, the burden's all on them. H how, do we, how do we address that? Yes, thank you again for the question and the opportunity to respond. I couldn't agree with you more. I think that there has been a pattern in this country of making mitigation funds available only following disasters. That is not the best use of taxpayer dollars, and we are seeing increasing risk in new places. And so absolutely, we should be encouraging the federal agencies to um, offer mitigation resources prior to disasters, not only following disaster declarations, which not all communities manage to get. Right. Any other panelist members' uh, comments? If I, if I yes, could, please. Senator, I, I do think that you're, you hit a very pivotal thing that I think as we look at natural disasters and FEMA's work over the next decade, given these growing costs, some fundamental changes need to be made so that when communities are making the investments, they are still meeting the partnership on the other side. At some point, there's this, almost this, this unfortunate do loop that says, if I just, if I avoid acting, then the federal government will come pay the full bill for me. If I take action, then I don't get help. And we, we need to fix that because that answer might have worked when the Stafford Act was put in place in the 80s. It's not the right answer today. Yeah, thank you. No, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Senator uh, Vance of Ohio is recognized. Great, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thanks to the uh, the two witnesses for being here with us this, uh, this morning. So, I want to ask a question just about about geospatial analysis and how it determines what goes in the the flood zones and what stays out of the flood zones. Uh, so, so most people assume that FEMA has been effective in determining low lying areas and hundred year flood zones, but geospatial specialists seem to agree almost half of the structures in our country apparently should be considered flood zones, um, or or those that should be considered flood zones are not. Um, and that obviously leaves out a huge number of American homes. Now, why is that? Well, NFIP recently changed to using geospatial technology to assess premium rates, but they currently still use horizontal maps to identify flood areas. Now, if the NFIP were to use the ge geospatial technology to replace their old maps with geospatially determined vertical-oriented flood maps, they could more accurately identify buildings with severe flood risk. So just one example, as I understand it, in the wake of Hurricane Ian, uh, which hit Lee County in southwestern Florida particularly hard, uh, my understanding is that only 25% of the homes had federal flood insurance and that if geospatially maps, geospatially based maps had been used, in fact, a much larger share of the homes in Lee County would have been covered. Um, so without litigating the ins and outs of climate change, I guess one of the questions that I have is when we talk about areas that are hit with unexpected flooding, and we attribute it to climate change, is at least part of what could be going on that we're not using accurate ma maps and that there are areas that clearly, and I'm directing this question first to Mr. Wright, but I'd love to get Mr. Hernandez's view as well. Are we actually not accurately identifying which homes are most susceptible to floods? And consequently, are we basically just ignoring a large area that has a high risk and instead attributing it to climate change, when in reality, we're just not accurately determining where the flood uh, risk is actually exists in this country. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Senator. I think that as you look at it, FEMA's using the same root technology for the rating and for the maps. The key difference here, and this really ties back to something that you may want to look at in, in the reforms and reauthorization of the program, the mandatory purchase delineation is described required by law and a regulation that is set at the 1% annual chance. And so it's the same inputs are going in, but there's a dynamic way to deal with the price that is now disconnected from what is a pretty old school way, as you described, says they draw a line and says, if you're inside the line, you must buy insurance. If you live just outside the line, you don't. I think we've got to change the education for folks to go if you live outside, no one prohibits you from getting insurance. In fact, it's cheaper. And so I think there's a change that has to happen in that space um, about where that limit and delineation, how people understand it. Interesting. Okay, Mr. Hernandez, I'd love to get your views too. Okay, so um, thank you, Senator, for the question. Um, I certainly can't speak to the engineering and modeling behind the the flood mapping, what I can say is from the community experience, I've been on the ground in communities that are having their floodplain maps updated, and it is 
scary and, um, you know, a jarring experience because it is actually working in creating the incentive to mitigate the risk. There are, you know, there's new technology. Often what we're finding is that the flood risk is much higher than was previously understood. And whereas that is a very difficult for an experience for a community to go through, it is definitely working in creating an incentive for mitigation. Then we have to help communities so that they knew, know what to do about it. Yeah. Can, can I just follow up, Mr. Wright, on, on something you said? You, you mentioned sort of this, the mandatory insurance within the line, the non-mandatory insurance outside the line. I mean, just in, in, in your experience, does that have a psychological effect on homeowners? I mean, if they're, if they're right outside the line and it's not mandatory, do they say, well, you know, we're not in the floodplain zone, so we're fine? For the most part. Interesting. I, I do think that there are places, we watched this in Hurricane Harvey, where uh, something like a third of the claims that were paid were outside the line, but they were people in low-lying flat areas and they knew they were at risk. And so they did lean in and, and buy that, that insurance. Um, I think for many of us, if we're told you don't have to spend money, you're less likely to spend it. Yeah. Yeah, got it. And 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 my understanding is is in terms of what falls in that one percent mandatory mapping, that that is they're using the old horizontal technology, not geospatial technology. Is that right, or do I have, I have that wrong? I would say it's a bit more intricate than it's that. They okay. are still using geospatial technologies. Um, what you're seeing there is that difference that, generally speaking, there is a dynamic parcel-by-parcel parcel way is how we do mapping across the country, and FEMA is still using a bright line. You're referring to as the horizontal yeah, side, but that, exactly. is that equivalent yeah, yeah. side in that world. Got it. Okay. Thank you both. Senator Warren. Uh, thank you, Acting Chairman. Uh, over the last 25 years, 99% of U.S. counties experienced at least one flooding event. In other words, flooding events are nearly universal. But people of color get hit harder due to aging infrastructure, structurally unsound homes, and federal policies like redlining that segregated communities of color and kept them closer to flood plains. Yet low-income neighborhoods and communities of color receive limited investments in flood protection. Reports show that FEMA disproportionately invests in protecting homes in white and wealthy communities from floods, reducing insurance costs, and boosting property values for those homeowners. Last year, FEMA Associate Administrator for Resilience, David Marstad, said that FEMA does not track the race or ethnicity of people who receive aid saying, and I quote him here, because we don't collect it, we don't discriminate against individuals, end quote. But just because there's not intentional discrimination does not mean that aid is distributed equitably. Ms. Hernandez, you are an expert on community development data and equity. Can you just describe how the failure to collect key demographic data can exacerbate inequity in FEMA programs? Thank you, Senator Warren, for the question. So yes, absolutely. Without accurate data, it is very hard to reach people with services and to direct those services to the people that need them most. So I couldn't agree more. Um, I had a, a colleague yesterday just looking at some numbers for who lives in the highest flood risk places in this country. And she was just telling me that there is a much higher share of people in poverty, families in poverty. There is a higher share of people that are older than 65 living in the most high risk places in this country and a higher share of people who self identify as people of color and Hispanic. So certainly there is, there are a lot of folks counting on both disaster mitigation and response services in the high flood risk areas. And so absolutely, data is needed. Um, I would say that that is true for FEMA and also for local governments and community leaders who are trying to make their case and advocate for resources. Okay, all right. So we start out structurally that there are more people of color, there are more poor people in areas that are prone to flood, but we can't track what's happening if we don't collect the data. Is that a, is that a fair sentence about it? 
Okay. Yes. So a year and a half ago, FEMA introduced Risk Rating 2.0, which is a new risk rating methodology for the National Flood Insurance Program. And the update included more variables, data sets, models on how the flood insurance program decides how much insurance for each individual house should cost, all with the aim of delivering more equitable pricing for policyholders. And I hope that FEMA delivers on these important goals. But we also need more far-reaching reforms, and that is why last year Congressman Benny Thompson and I introduced the FEMA Equity Act to ensure greater equity in disaster assistance programs, including by improving data collection to measure disparate outcomes and participation barriers and requiring equity criteria be applied to policies and programs. Now, Ms. Fernandez, from your experience, would the provisions in our bill have helped make FEMA programs like the National Flood Insurance Program more equitable so they reach all communities that are in need of disaster assistance? Thank you, Senator, for the question. So I'm not prepared to speak to any specific legislation, but provisions like those um, are absolutely helpful for encouraging and supporting FEMA in reaching the people who are most impacted by disasters and for advancing mitigation as well. You know, for too long, frontline communities have been disproportionately impacted by the devastating effects of natural disasters. We need to work to address that injustice and to ensure that federal programs are actually fixing the disparity, not making it worse by forcing people to pay more than their fair share or by limiting relief to the people who need it most. The Biden administration has made important reforms to address inequities in federal disaster management programs, but there is more to be done both to codify and to build on these changes, and I will continue to fight for that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Kennedy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Wright and Ms. Hernandez, thank you both for being here. Mr. Wright, do you own a home? I do. Do you have a mortgage? I do. Does your mortgage company require you to carry homeowner's insurance? It does. Okay. Suppose your homeowner's insurance insurer came to you and said, look, Mr. Wright, I can't tell you why, but I'm going to start raising your premium 18% a year mm -hmm. because we hired this, this group called Milliman, and they've come up with this magical algorithm that can take a look at your home, not your neighbor's home, but your home, and predict over the next... Uh, 30 years, your risk every single year of whether you're going to have a fire. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to start raising your rates 18% a year. We can't tell you how long we're going to stop raising those rates. Mm -hmm. We can, and, and, um, 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 and, and we can't explain to you the minimum algorithm because it's mm -hmm. secret. If we showed it to you, we'd have to kill you. What would you do? You know, I I get increases in the cost. Would of my you find insurance. a new help? Try to find a new insurer. Uh, I would ask questions uh, to seek to understand, and I may shop for another insurer. What if you What if you can't shop? What if, What if there are no other insurers, mm -hmm. and the, your mortgage company says no? You've got to take this insurance. Mm -hmm. Well, Senator, I I think that as we look at these dimensions, there are pieces of algorithms as you speak to, uh, that we should be clear and show folks what those pieces are, and we have to understand yeah, but that it, it is see, not FEMA a rhythm. doesn't. FEMA doesn't. A and FEMA, FEMA has rolled out this program. Mm -hmm. They won't share the algorithm. Mm -hmm. There are 500,000 insurance, federal, uh, 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 flood insurance policies in America. 10% of them are in my state. My people don't have million-dollar mansions on the Gulf. Mm -hmm. These are working people. And their 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 uh, their mortgage company requires them to carry flood insurance. Is the only way to get it. For example, in Cameron Parish, the average new cost of flood insurance there is four thousand four hundred and fifty four dollars. The median household income is forty eight thousand dollars. And the wind and insurance Plaquemines is high Parish, as well. The new the new 
price for insurance is $5,431. The median household income is $65,000. In St. Mary Parish, the new, a new flood insurance policy costs $5,226, and the median household income is $40,218. Now, these people can't afford flood insurance, but... But, but they'll have to give up their home if, if they don't carry it. And if they go to FEMA and say, you raised my, my, my uh, premiums 18% this year. How long are you going to keep doing it? They say, we can't tell you that. And, and these people say to FEMA, my people say to FEMA, uh, have you considered levies, mm -hmm. the impact of the levies? And FEMA says, we don't have to answer that. And then my people go to FEMA and, and they say, well, why are you doing this? Well, we have this new algorithm. And they say, can, can we see the algorithm to hire somebody to look at the algorithm and see if, you're, see, if, to see if you're considering levies? And they say, oh, no. If we show you the algorithm, um, we'll have to kill you. And then my people find out that in 2022, in a secret memo that FEMA didn't want to come out, they're estimating... FEMA estimates that 900,000 policyholders, 20% of all the policyholders for flood insurance in the com country, they figure they're going to drop their insurance. Yeah. So Mr. Now, Kennedy, what's the point of flood insurance if nobody can afford it? So and what's the point of having a federal agency paid for with people's taxpayer dollars if they won't explain to the people what they're doing? So, Senator, I are you still for risk rating 2.0? So, Senator, I am five years removed from making decisions in FEMA, and yes, I was the person who launched risk rating 2.0. And so, we've had these conversations, and I'll, I'm happy to continue to do so. Well, you I, didn't. You, uh, no, not, this isn't personal to you. I, just, I don't know what I, your involvement was, but the people that implemented this and rolled it out in this manner ought to hide their head in a bag. So, I do think that FEMA should be transparent about what they're doing. I also know that these insurance calculations are more like calculus than they are arithmetic, but the risks are growing. The cost of wind insurance in Southern Louisiana is just as high or higher. And so I think there's an affordability need for sure. Um, but we've got to look at this. Yes, FEMA should be showing the pieces um, we need to make sure people understand it. I think people need to know which mitigation they're actions not, have a difference. They're not. And, and Senator, I right, think, you know that. And, nor and do the people at FEMA seem to care. I can, all I can say to you is that there are increasing risks. Those costs in some places, I was just in Cameron and Calcasieu Parish last month. I understand this. They're still recovering from, uh, from Ida and Laura that came I, I, through. I've, I've got to wrap this up. If the IRS came to you and said, we, we, I don't know how much money you make, I don't want to know. If the IRS came to you and said, we're going to do your taxes for you this year, Mr. Wright, you owe $4 million in income taxes. Mm -hmm. But we can't tell you how we came up with the figure. Yeah. You think that'd be fair? Uh, that, that would not be a fair action by no, the IRS. I wouldn't, would it? Thank you, Senator Kennedy. Senator Scott has a question, and then I will do a question. I think Senator Fetterman's on the way. Thanks, Senator Kennedy, for your, your, your thoughtful approach on getting, getting questions answered. That would not be fair. Thank you. To flood mitigation uh, and repetitive losses, uh, my understanding is, according to FEMA, Ms. Wright, this question is for you, and happy for you to weigh in as Ms. Hernandez as well, but 1% of the losses account for about 30% of the payouts. Said in numbers, it's about $12.5 billion of damages, averaging roughly $84,000 per property, is a property that has experienced a loss after a loss after a loss after a loss, and sometimes a fifth loss. Uh, my legislation takes steps toward ending this cycle of flooding and rebuilding and flooding and rebuilding and flooding and rebuilding, followed by flooding and rebuilding. It requires local communities to think about better ways to mitigate the risk at these properties. Addressing flood risk isn't simply about the property. When you have that many consistent floods, you typically have a significant loss of lives. Thoughts quickly, 
since Senator Fetterman is here. Yes, uh, thank you. And I think that this issue related to repetitive losses is a very unique one because FEMA on the national flood insurance is ostensibly the insurer of last resort for flood. Under the current statute, they have no choice but to offer flood insurance to anyone who seeks it. As I said in my testimony, we need to address the mitigation from two angles. One of them at the neighborhood scale. We've got to address that thing more broadly. The kind of projects that we talked about in Three Forks are case in point. Give the water a place to go. And I would go further, because in the private market side of the equation, by the time you have filed that many claims, they tell you you can't have that insurance at that price any longer. Um, and you know, we began to call these the extreme repetitive losses uh, when I was there. And I think you've got to find a, a way to, yes, lean on the community, because I think your bill uh, is proposed, outlines, you got to do planning for this. But these most egregious ones that make the front page of the newspaper yes. are planning often going to be structures that someone needs to walk in and says, insure it yourself. Stop making someone else pay this bill. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Scott. Chairman. Senator Fetterman of Pennsylvania is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Pennsylvanians have seen firsthand the awful impact on flooding on their homes and lives. During Hurricane Ida, residents in and around Philadelphia were sheltered within the storm toward their, excuse me, toward their homes apart. People, people shared their stories of swimming out of their homes, part of the Vine Street X-ray was underwater, and there are roughly $3 billion in damage. As climate change makes storms even worse, floodwaters are showing up outside federally designated flood zones like Metaltown, Pennsylvania, which flooded in 2017, despite being away from the Susquehanna River and Swatara Creek and, or York County, where I, where I grew up in, some of the townships were impacted by a 2018 flood that is few, which has had only its two policies. Ms. Hernandez, how does the National Flood Insurance Program in rural communities experience increased flood risks for the very first time? Mm. Thank you, Senator Fetterman, for that question. So, interestingly, the last two comments have been, you know, about communities that have been flooded over and over and over again from Senator Scott and um, communities that are seeing flood risks and floods for the first time. And I would say that in all of these cases, rural communities need resources and help. In the case of repetitive floods, people are exhausted and local government staff have their time split between many responsibilities in the case of communities that are seeing floods for the first time, um, there is not the, the know-how and the institutional knowledge to navigate the solutions that are needed. So this is a place where state agencies and federal governments can lend a lot of help. Yeah. So well, how, how can we imp improve the ed education about flood risks uh, before di disasters and get resources to them faster after disaster? Thanks for that follow-up question, Senator Fetterman. Education and mapping are really critical first steps. Um, information for residents living in flood-prone communities like real estate disclosures are super important, but there, then there's the follow-up. It's after you know that you have flood risk, um, you need to have uh, help understanding the solutions and as Mr. Wright has called out several times, the most effective solutions, both in terms of safeguarding people's properties and the most responsible use of taxpayer dollars, is to do flood risk reduction projects at a neighborhood or community scale. That really involves your local government who is responsible for those types of infrastructure decisions. Yeah. And doctor. Um, uh, oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, please go ahead. If you have something more to add. I think that the point that is there that is so important, and as we watch communities who have no recent memory of flooding experience it for the very first time, it 
creates this reactive piece. And it's one thing to tell folks, which is true, if it rains there, it can flood. But the flip side is until it invades their community the first time, um, they're not taking action. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Fetterman. Uh, thank you all. Let me do one real last question. And uh, Dr. Kuski to you in, in Philadelphia, with the difference in the speed and extent of recovery, largely based on a family having, having insurance, how important is it to create an NFIP affordability program so that coverage is expanded? Yes, as we've discussed, I think this is really necessary. Research shows how difficult people's recovery can be without the financial protection of insurance. And so expanding access to insurance for those who can't afford it provides this protection for them, but it's also a necessary condition for other aspects of recovery. We see spillover positive benefits into emotional well-being, physical and mental health, phys um, educational attainment, the stability of families, which are all tied to being able to access the resources needed to make um, repairs and improvements and get your life back together. So um, something to help folks with the cost of disaster insurance would have these wider impacts on well-being as well. Thank you. Um, thanks to the three witnesses for joining us. Uh, thanks to colleagues who were here and asked questions. For senators who wish to submit questions for the record, those questions are due one week from today, Tuesday, May 9th. To the witnesses, you have 45 days, please, to respond to these questions. Uh, thank you again. With that, this hearing is adjourned.